Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Claims Corner. For those of you who are new to joining us, you, or you maybe joined us last year for our Flood News at Noon series, this has evolved. Claims Corner has evolved from our Flood News at Noon, where we would bring on an expert from the flood industry, subject matter expert, to give us their perspective, their insight into a particular subject. If you want to catch some of those uh, Flood News at Noon episodes, you can find them on our YouTube channel, which is at CNC Catastrophe National Claims channel. Today, once again, we have another expert with us. And this expert, again, comes from the flood industry and has been in the industry for, I want to say, around 20 years now, been involved and brought their expertise. And we're going to talk today about manufactured homes and mobile homes. So, um, Terry, tell us a little bit about how you got into this, how you started, become, started in the flood industry to begin with. Well, like most people in the industry, I started as an independent adjuster. And... You know, um, I met a guy and he says, hey, you know, would you like to um, look at our industry? And we went in and sat down and he showed me some paperwork and he took, sent me on a ride with a guy and I came back and he says, can you do that? And I said, well, yes, I can do that. And so that was where it all began. And it was, uh, it, it was a little rocky to begin with and uh, the training was less than stellar, but we worked through it and, and that got me my start. Um, I then worked on up with a couple of other firms and did some uh, claims management for a firm. And my latest position is what I'm doing right now is I'm the uh, general adjuster for FEMA Region 4. We have 10 regions in the country and Region 4 is the largest policy count region and it covers the southeastern United States from the Carolinas down through Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, all the way up through Kentucky. So that's my area of responsibility. Um, whenever things are happening there, I'm supposed to be involved in it. And of course, when we have a big event, like a Harvey we discussed earlier, the entire team comes together and we all concentrate our efforts wherever the, the need is. So we, we have our regions, but as a team, we do whatever needs to be done to, to take care of our policyholders, assist our adjusting firms and the independent adjusters. We're here, um, we're here to help. We want to be an asset Absolutely. to the entire community. Yeah. And you're going to bring us some of your expertise on the top of, of mobile homes, manufactured homes. Yeah, it, it's a subject that, that quite frankly, needs some more attention. Um, we see a lot of uh, manufactured home claims that, that overlook key points. Um, some of the mistakes that happen uh, set artificially low limits of liability for the policyholders. Um, there's a lot of things about manufactured homes which are unique and very different from a dwelling form. Um, and it requires, you know, we use the, the, the buzzword, specialized knowledge. It, it requires specialized knowledge and experience to do. It's not a gimme. It, it should not be just handed out to anyone because the absence of that experience can do harm for our policyholders. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we really want to avoid because the claims journey of a policyholder is rough enough. We don't want to put additional obstacles. We don't want to um, artificially shortchange them because of some decisions or factors that were put in place early in the adjustment process. So it's important that the person who's going to adjust a manufactured home understand these features. And we're going to talk about those. And, you know, I've got a few slides that will, will hit all the high points, but, you know, there's some commentary in between that we'll add to it to try to um, make people aware of what's important about a manufactured home. How is it different? How to keep the claim on the rails. Let's not get it sidetracked so that we, we, we do harm. We want to help these people as yeah. best we can. Yeah, yeah, and that's one thing I'll point out. To, to an adjuster, they don't understand. It, it, there seems there's a gray area where they they don't understand what is needed while they're out there looking at a manufactured home, while they're scoping it. And there's a lot of you if you overlook those steps, yes. then it does cause issues. It does cause coverage issues, or um, I mean, a situation where you go out and you discover a couple weeks later that they didn't have coverage to begin with, that yes. it, it didn't qualify to begin with as a building. Right. And it's a little things like that. So hopefully you'll give us some of that. And Dan's also with us today. Um, Dan's going to be asking a couple questions as well. Dan, is, uh, he's our, what is your position now? I am the Director of Flood Operations. Exactly. That's what Dan's position that's, is. That's and, what I am. 
And I'm Craig Fowler. For those who do not know me, I'm Craig Fowler. I'm the Executive Vice President of Training here at CNC. So let's jump right into it. Um, let's okay. talk about manufactured homes. And I know it's one thing you don't have on there is mobile home. You don't have a list as mobile home. Older manufactured homes were at one time referred to as mobile homes. But after a period of time, the industry and the National Flood Insurance Program reclassified them as manufactured homes. It is a synonymous term. Yes. Um, it has yes. simply to do with age. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's no harm or foul with transposing those two identifiers, but manufactured homes is the term that we, we now use. And anything that was older, and I think it was 1982, was considered yep. a mobile home. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just bring them forward. There are still some of those older homes out there. And if they're well cared for and renovated and, you know, we're, we're, we're they survive. With, we're dealing with one right now. They <laughs> survive. It's extremely and old. <laughs> they're not, they're, they're yeah. not as, as strong and as well built as a stick built home, but, but they do survive. Yeah. And in some places, they survive because they won't be able to put anything back if they ever let it go. Yeah. There's a, a restriction that says, you know, you can't replace this. So they have to keep it going if they want to maintain that dwelling at that location. So that's why some of them survive. And as long as we don't call it a trailer. Right. And I know that's a term sometimes people use, you know, and they'll, and, you know, when you see, think of trailer, you immediately think of old dirt or clay road and the yeah. trailer's sitting up there and it's barely, and that, that's just a term that's... It's that, a slang term. It's, it's kind it of is. derogatory. It is, yeah, yeah exactly. And yeah. we want to make sure that we're using the proper terminology when we refer to it. Yeah, a policy it is a home, it is a home to the sure. absolutely. And and it's their home. In, in some areas, <laughs> That's their only. That's one of their few options. Yeah, they can get into something that can be placed and livable in a fairly short period of time. Not a three month, God forbid today, a nine month turnkey on a house. They can have a house delivered and set up within a few weeks yeah. of securing their finances, yeah. however that means. And in some areas, that's the only option that they have yeah. because they don't have an alternative place to live. They got to have a place now, and that's that's one of the issues that these things pick up. So. What is a manufactured home? Start with some simple defi uh, definitions. It's a factory built home. That means that it is built at a remote location and transported. It consists of one or more sections. I've seen singles, doubles, and triple wides. I, I believe I saw a picture once of a quad wide. Really? Um, each section is built on a steel chassis to support the frame. The steel chassis is an integral part of the structure and becomes a part of the foundation once the home is installed. The I-beams that are in, in board from the perimeter walls, they stay with the home. The wheels, axles, tongue, they may all be removed during the installation process. A key feature of a manufactured home is the regulation. Manufactured homes are built to a code established and enforced by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. We're going to shorten that to HUD, H-U-D. All manufactured homes are regulated by HUD. They are not regulated by the state, and they're not regulated by uh, IRC building codes. The feds are fully responsible. Okay? And obviously here's a picture of what is very likely to be a double wide on its way. It's being transported by a truck. The chassis and the wheels, one, two, three, four, five, six axles underneath. The tongue is there and all that stuff. In most cases today, all that stuff will be removed once they set it up and skirt it. How do you determine if you're looking at a manufactured home? If I had to pick a single element which would positively identify a manufactured home, it would be the HUD data plate. There are two items that are on every manufactured home. This is one of them. This is an example of a HUD data plate. You'll see some uh, wind and snow load maps of the United States which designate um, specifications. Um, if, you're in, if the building you're inspecting has a HUD data plate, you're done. You've got a manufactured home. You don't have anything else. That's a solid. So once you've got that, you know what you're dealing with. Everything you do from that point forward needs to follow the SFIP and the Flood Claims Handbook on the Adjustment of Manufactured Homes. So this is, this is a, one of two very important plates that you'll, you should find. Now, this is an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, which is adhered somewhere inside this manufactured mm -hmm. home. Sometimes they get lost or destroyed. 
the policyholder can actually get a replacement. There's a federal agent, there's, there's a, an independent agent that the federal government allows to replace these. Replace but they cost $50 for one, $100 for one in a hurry. So it's an expensive piece of paper. <laughs> so if um, <coughs> policyholder, you know, the adjuster goes out there and they're taking a look at the mobile home, right. manufacturing home, they have an uh, issue locating this mm -hmm. information. Is it best to have the policy holder go ahead and obtain one, through, or, is, or is there is there a way that the adjuster can obtain it? And how and how adjuster, critical is this information for the worksheet? The one piece of information on here that you absolutely need. This is an indication. Mm -hmm. This is going to be there when it's built. The one piece of information on this sheet of paper that you really need is right here, which you can't read. It's the serial number. Sure. And we do have an alternative. We do have an okay, option. Perfect. So, and you're going to get there, I'm sure. I am. The data awesome. plate will include the manufacturer's name and address, the date the home was built. Which is very important. Kind of. We'll get to that too. Got Date yeah, was built, ahead. <laughs> serial number, model number, and the code, the HUD code which was in effect at the time it was manufactured. Those codes change. Do we care about that? Not really. If it's got the plate, it was built the way it was supposed to be built at the time it was built. We don't really need to worry about it. There's nothing related to the adjustment process that this would have any impact on. Again, another example of the same data plate. Now, where are we going to find it? Kitchen cabinet door, lower cabinet door, back wall of a bedroom closet or the master bedroom closet, inside a water heater closet, on the inside of a bathroom vanity, and other places. There's no standard. <coughs> Each manufacturer sticks this eight and a half by 11 piece of paper in what they believe to be an obvious spot where it will be retained and it won't have to be removed or disturbed. It shouldn't be taken down. It's kind of like, oh, let me think. It's kind of like the tag on your um, mattress. mattress. Do not remove under penalty of law. I've torn too many of those to think about. But anyway, it's, it's one of those things. It really shouldn't be, it's really important. And, so, it, and, it, and it's usually behind something. Yeah, it's not visible but, as you walk yeah. around. It'll be on the back side of a door, inside a closet, on the back wall of a small closet, not on the door of a closet. You're going to have to look for it. Which you should be anyway. Yes. I mean, you should be scoping. You should be opening yeah. doors and drawers and cabinets and taking pictures and identifying stuff throughout the property. So you're going to come across but it. But think of it should. like your flood line. Your yeah. flood line. It's one of those critical pictures that this claim is going to need. Yeah. If you, you find, find it. it, if you find but it. But you should find it. But you, you look. Get, you need to look and you need to be confident that if you didn't find it, it wasn't there. Yes. I wish yep. I could tell you yep. that four spots, you're done. I can't. Yeah. It's not that easy. All right. There is a second data plate. Um, it's called a HUD tag. This tag is an aluminum tag and it's got an embossed number on it. This is also placed on every manufactured home, every piece of every manufactured home. It's two inches by four inches. It's typically placed one foot above the bottom and one foot from the edge of the back of each section of the manufactured home. Note, there is an embossed number on here. This is not your serial number. This is a number which identifies the manufacturer. That number doesn't do anything for you. It's gonna be there, you don't use it, but you'll recognize this plate, it's either red or silver. And again, it's two by four. So, but that's another indication you've got a manufactured home. It tells you what you've got, it doesn't help it doesn't, you. But it doesn't help you. Doesn't help you on the claim. But it's always a manufacturer. All right. Finally, a unique serial number is stamped into the steel cross member where the hitch is attached to each section of the mobile home. Sorry, manufactured home. Hint, this is important. If you find the interior HUD data plate, you will save yourself a crawl underneath the home because you will already have the serial number. If you don't find the HUD plate, that eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, you get to crawl up under the manufactured home and look for the cross member, and there's the serial number stamped into it. That's like the VIN number on a car. It's built to be permanent. Yeah. So it, it won't be rubbed off, it won't be peeled off, it's stamped into the steel. It's there, but you're gonna get to go under the house. Which you should have. You should Sometimes you should have that should be fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. These yeah. are Invariably, these are elevated homes, so Absolutely. you need yeah. to get under there and take pictures. You need to look at the skirting. You need to look at the belly, uh, the, uh, the insulation downs, enclosure, tie-downs, plumbing, electrical, all the things that are there. 
This is one more thing. opportunity to pop, get that. That's right. Everybody and get it there and get it. I'm going to so. tell you, I don't remember seeing one of these pictures ever in a claim. <laughs> Honestly, I don't. Uh, and if you get the HUD plate inside, you don't need this. Yeah. But yeah. if you don't have the HUD plate, you there's your that. there's your backup. That's your serial yeah. number. And you cannot complete the work the full home worksheet without the serial number. So the paper can disappear. This can't disappear. Yeah. They can paint yeah. over it. It's, it'll be there. It'll be there. All right. Unique issues involving the adjustment of a manufactured home. This is where we start talking about what you need to do differently. Why this isn't a dwelling. Site built, stick built. This is another animal. It's transported on the road, it's designed and built so that it can be moved mm -hmm. to a new location. Mm -hmm. People don't typically do that, but it can be. And because of that, it, it, it has a different way of being valued. It's also a depreciable asset. A traditional home appreciates in value in average markets. There is no market, I'm not aware of any markets where a manufactured home appreciates in value. Maybe a blip, but not in general. It's a declining asset. All right, so first item, NFIP authorization. There was a time when every dwelling form, I'm sorry, every dwelling adjuster got manufactured home yeah. as a gimme. Yeah. That time is gone. Some of our problems are because we gave this authorization without any justifiable reason because it was just another dwelling. And we've stopped that now. You gotta qualify for it. Your first authorization is dwelling, period. This is an add-on that you're gonna have to qualify for. If you don't have it, don't do it. Correct. Or talk to your claims supervisor, your claims specialist, whoever's your company, and say, look, you know, I may need some help on this. I don't know what to do with this. I don't wanna mess it up. Can I work with somebody? Get some help, because we want it to go right. Is, it, is there a set to qualify for that? If you really, really want to do a mobile home, to qualify for that, is there something, you, you're talking about the qualification now, is there something set that adjusters should do, or is this? They're, they're looking really for experience, okay. which means you've okay. worked which with work someone. With, yeah. it, it's with anything. Yeah. You know, your FACP program gets somebody in who's not experienced, so that they get the experience. So they get the experience. Well, you're working thing. with. Uh, That's if you really want to do it as an adjuster. Yeah. <laughs> it, they're, they're not terribly hard, they're just different. And yep. because even Correct. the adjusters who know how to do them don't do them very often. Correct. And things change. And even if they don't, we don't do them often, so the memory of exactly how they go isn't as fresh as doing a dwelling. So, and just like, like you point out, the valuation methods, I mean, that's unique. Valuation methods are critical. That's probably the place where we find the most problems which cause injury to the policyholder. We either overpay them or we underpay them. We don't want to do either. If we underpay them, we've obviously harmed them. And if we fix it later, we haven't fixed it because we've paid them what they were owed to begin with at a later date. Money in six months is not the same as money in one month. It's lost value. They've had to make decisions along the way to get their home livable again. And those decisions can't be undone by giving you the rest of the money later. They had to decide to use lower quality or not to repair things yeah. and and those decisions are hard to reverse um, overpayment if you value that thing without the proper depreciation that time brings and then you adjust that claim using those high thresholds you can overpay the policyholder and that will result in the policyholder having to return money, and we don't want that either. No. That's a hard call to make. Nobody wants to do that. Um, pre and post firm status. Manufactured homes aren't rated as pre and post firm like everything else. They're not, so we'll get to that too. Okay. Manufactured home worksheet is an additional document that is part of every manufactured home claim the new manufactured home worksheet is rather detailed, much more so than the old one. Lots of drop downs. It's very helpful to get it filled out. Um, but there's a lot of information that they're asking for. It's not just make model serial, mm -hmm. tie downs, and a couple of numbers. There's a lot more information on it. It's become a much 
more detail form, and it will help guide you through the process. Uh, fewer questions. It, it's more intuitive. Federal forms aren't usually known for being intuitive, but this one's better. And, and I like it, and when you actually work with it, you'll ask a few questions along the way, but there's, if you hover over the form, a pop-up window will give you a little bit of verbiage to kind of tell you what you're supposed to be typing. It's an interactive PDF. Your software may not allow you to, may not give you all of these features, mm -hmm. but you can go down to the, over the federal side and you can pull a document down as a PDF and you can hover over the spots and you can practice with it and learn everything you need to know. And a lot of the questions on that form need to be answered while you're at the site. Because if you go away a day or two later and try to fill it out, you may find out that I may have to go back. Yeah. Now going yeah. back, yeah, going back is something we want to avoid. So mm -hmm. it's inconvenient for us, it's also inconvenient for the policyholder. Anchoring requirements. Um, elevated homes are often anchored by sheer weight. Yeah. They're sitting on yeah. piers. Manufactured homes are required to be anchored down in special flood hazard zones. You can't just sit them there and, and hope they stay put. You've got to anchor them down. They'll float away. Regular houses will too, but it's really it's dramatic when they do. Yeah, exactly. Special exactly. off settlement. Um, special off settlement is a unique settlement practice which is specific to manufactured homes only. No other type of building can be adjusted using a special loss settlement. And we'll go further into detail on that as well. But these are the high points. There are probably, you know, if you sit down and you work through a complete claim and you start dissecting it carefully, we could probably fill in a few other subtleties. But these are the big things that, that an adjuster needs to be focused on to make sure that we don't overlook something that's really important in the process. Of manufacturing home adjustment. All right, so some of this will be a little bit of a rehash, but NFIP authorization. There was a time when manufactured home authorization was included whenever an adjuster received their initial authorization to adjust flood claims for the NFIP. Fortunately, this is no longer the case. We're expecting them to have specialized knowledge and experience mm -hmm. before they step out to independently adjust one of these. That's going to take care of our policyholder. It's going to put the adjuster in a position where he's confident with what he's doing, he's doing it right, and we protect the policyholder, we protect the program. Those two, th those are our taskmasters. Do those two things, and you've done right. Everything else will fall into place. Um, if you receive a manufactured home assignment and are not authorized, please seek guidance from your claims management team. Get that done. Hopefully they hear that. Uh, valuation methods. This can be very deep. We're yeah. going to do yeah. this at a, at a 40 yard look down because okay. this can get really yes, deep. It can. And it's, pro it's probably beyond the scope of what we can go over in just a few we, minutes. We could spend a whole hour yes. easily on just on this. So we often find manufactured homes to be overinsured. Why? Because they're a depreciable asset. Because of this, an accurate valuation is critical, very critical part of the adjustment process. There are two, and I'm going to call them paths because it, it's not a one-shot deal. It's a path. There are two paths to a proper manufactured home valuation, and I've titled them a new replacement cost where the manufacturer is still in business. They still make something like what they made. You can get a replacement cost for like kind and quality, or you've got a comparable manufacturer who it's not a Pontiac, it's an Oldsmobile. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's a similar item, it's got a different name on it, but it still fits the mold. So there's where you can get a new replacement cost from which you can apply depreciation. The other path is the depreciated retail value. Now, a depreciated retail value is not a term that we use frequently in the industry. But if I tell, if I take this out and I put NADA, J.D. Powers NADA, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. NADA will produce not a replacement cost and not an actual cash value. It'll produce what's called a depreciated retail value. And from there, you can um, complete your valuation. There's much more to the valuation 
than just the two pieces or one piece that travel on the road. Yeah. So we've got to account for a lot more than that, and we'll do so in a moment. There are numerous approved methods to properly value a manufactured home. A partial list of methods can be found on the current manufactured home worksheet. If you go to the manufactured home worksheet, there's an area with valuation. There's a button you can click. It'll pop down about, it's probably 14 methods that are considered acceptable. Now, if you've attended a recent NFIP claims adjuster presentation, you heard that FEMA is frowning on the use of software valuations from SimSaw, Xactimate, or any other claims adjusting software. Those valuations are at best inaccurate. Um, they don't properly represent the value. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to properly determine the value. And those valuations don't do that. They fall short. Um, they don't use enough detail. And, you know, I've talked to some of the people at both companies and, and there's some differing opinions as to whether they really are that accurate. Yeah. Um, FEMA doesn't feel that they are. So they're asking that that's not your primary method. Okay. A proper valuation should take into account additions, options, and all costs associated with the delivery and installation of the manufactured home. If you've got a piece of property and it's blank and the manufactured home gets installed, everything that's involved in that process is part of that manufactured home. Yeah. The blocks, the plumbing, the electrical, the tie downs, the transportation, all the additions and options that did not come on the sticker. Okay? Not to be overlooked are the utility connections, foundation elements, stairs, and other integral parts and components of the manufactured home. Special considerations. What is that? That is a trailer. That is a <laughs> travel trailer. That's what it looks like. With two slide two outs. Two slide outs. The axles are gone. It's affixed to a permanent foundation. Yes, and it it's elevated at least 12 feet in it's the not, air. That's not going anywhere. They're, they're, not, they're not driving that off. <laughs> no, they are not moving that yeah. in the event a large storm is yeah. coming. There are some considerations here that need to be taken into account when you do the valuation. Your valuation has to account for it not sitting here mm -hmm. or not even sitting on blocks. Mm -hmm. It's up, mm -hmm. supported by piles and beams, and it's over roofed. There's a lot there beyond a. Six thousand dollar, ten year old travel trailer, yeah. and if that is acknowledged and recognized by the local community, that's an adjustable property, and it's considered real property in most places. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'll throw something out here that's not in the group because it just came to mind. In Florida and possibly in other states, there's a process by which you can take a manufactured home and, through a series of steps, convert it to real property. And if it's converted to real property, it no longer gets one of those annual license yeah. plate decals, yeah. and it's no longer movable, and it's, no, it's considered now an improvement versus just something that happens to be on the land. So keep that in mind, because that does happen. We've seen it um, down around the Keys okay. and in other areas in Florida where you have um, a lot of park models, but they can convert this to real property, which does change some things. Mm -hmm. So just keep that in Is mind. Is there a certain amount of documentation that we're looking for with those situations? Just something um, specifically pointed to it. The state will give them, um, well, first off, you can look at the tax records. It'll be listed as an improvement now instead of the land plus nothing. Because if you have a, you know, if you have a travel trailer sitting on a um, piece of land, it's not going to be listed on tax rolls. Um, but the process does end up giving the policyholder a document that says, this is now your real property, and it's taxed differently. So, Excellent. All right, um, additions. It would not be uncommon for you to go out to a manufactured home and find that the addition has more value than the original home. Yeah. You're still working with a manufactured home, but you have to account for the value here. And that also includes differing materials when you start doing your adjustment. 
this is not uncommon. In this situation where do you do two valuations? One for the addition, one for the manufactured home? Or there, there's two methods, and, and that's going to have to go to your insurer. The insurer is going to have to give you guidance on that. But okay. you can start with this, mm -hmm. and you can add to it. Mm -hmm. Or you can do two different valuations and then combine those. Combine. And I've seen it done both ways. Uh, and that was the question. I've seen it done both ways and, before. And, it's, there's and no I'm not seeing it. I don't see that there's a... The problem with doing the additions and this is from experience, if you do the manufactured home valuation and you start doing the additions, you're limited in how you can value this. Mm -hmm. um, when you're doing, for instance, an NADA, when you do an addition or an add-on, they don't give you a lot of options as to what you can do and how you can, and they'll say, you know, there's a door here. Um, when they start valuing that door, they ask you for its age, and there's only a couple of options, yeah. you know, yeah. one, three, five, and th the depreciation is pretty aggressive more so than if this was a pure stick built. So my thoughts would be consider the outcome to the policyholder. If, if we value it by splitting it and it gives the policyholder more valued coverage to the benefit of the policyholder, then we've done no harm to the policyholder and we've protected the, the program. Um, but I'm going to I'm going to defer back to the insurer because they're going to have the final we'll say in yeah. what they want their claim to look yeah. like. But again, you're right. It, it, I've seen it both, ways, seen both ways, and I didn't see wrong in either one. But if we did two of them side by side, the outcome would be slightly different mm -hmm. and possibly significantly, depending on who's doing the work. So I want you to remember this picture. I'm have a question in a few minutes. Okay. Once we get further in the slide, that's not the best picture. That's one where obviously the manufactured mm -hmm. home has been enveloped by, mm, yeah. and, and I've seen it much worse than this. I've gone out on situations where you didn't even know you had a manufactured home until you walked down a central hallway and you found a, a furnace door and you opened it and you realized, oh, wait, <laughs> there's a manufactured home inside this house. And, you know, it can happen. Is that the one you're talking about? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, they get lost. Yeah. They very, get, very lost. They get lost yeah. inside it, and you, you look underneath, and the steel framework yeah. is still there. And you start putting two to two together, and you're trying to figure we out. We hope you put two and two together. <laughs> yes. And yeah, so that's. And uh, that's why we're having this discussion. Sorry. It's. They say there's nothing new under the sun. Well, travel, travel the work, travel the oh, states, yeah. and do oh, yeah. claims, and you will find things that will make you scratch your head and, and doubt yourself. And that's where. You know, j just like our team, if, if we come on something like this and somebody asks a question, our team, the GA team, we'll pull a conference call up and four, mm -hmm. five, or six of us sit down and say, look, you know, how do we want to address this? Mm -hmm. What is best for the policyholder, for the policy, and, and is most fair? Because ultimately, that's our job. And looking at it from a step back from it, look at it and discuss it. Um, okay. <laughs> Never seen that one before. Well, never say never, right? Exactly. That looks like, uh, I think that's what, a Ford Econ line? I think that's, so. That's uh, built onto the side of a, and this isn't necessarily even a manufactured home, but it's an addition. <laughs> and how would you value the addition? Would you do a separate NADA? <laughs> hey, you know. That, that's when we go. There's to, even a tag back here. That's when we go to the insurance, okay. Yeah. This, this is different. Yeah. This is unique. But you see anything out there. I mean, you do. I mean, people will do anything. I wonder if it still had the wheels on it. I wonder if it actually ran. Well, they had to get it there somehow. Yeah. But they skirted it. They skirted it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, nice. if the wheels are down there, they're no good. <laughs> okay. Uh, pre and post firm status. This is really important because this can have a huge impact on the adjustment. Because if you're in a special flood hazard zone, if you have post firm elevated, you've got a lot of stuff you can't pay for. So. Unlike a traditional dwelling, the firm status of the manufactured home is not determined by the date of manufacture, but by one of the two of the following methods. The firm status of a manufactured home on an individually owned lot or tract of land is based on the date the home was affixed to the site. When was it placed? It placed. Doesn't matter when it was built. It could be 10 years old when it was placed there yesterday. It could have been relocated. It does happen. Mm -hmm. Second, 
The firm status of a manufactured home in a manufactured home park or subdivision is based on the date the facilities were constructed to service the manufactured home site. So if you've got a manufactured home park, their date of construction of that, let's say it was done in phases. If that's phase two, yeah. when phase two was complete, that's your firm date for everything that gets parked in phase two. Phase one could be a different firm date. Phase three would, would be beyond phase two. So it's not the date of manufacture. It's not the date it was placed. It's the date facilities were constructed to service and that could be manufactured home 1971 site. and you have a 2021 manufactured home it's, it's a pre firm building and that flies people against go wait a minute that's that not flies right. against everything that's that right. we know yeah, it, yeah but it's pre firm it, it can it challenges everything that we would mm -hmm. say it was installed yesterday the firm date is december 31 1974 the oldest firm date that's out mm -hmm. there but it was installed yesterday and yet it's pre firm it's pre firm elevated because because the construction date now you ask 20 adjusters that think they know flood manufactured home that question yeah. and you're going to get some wrong answers right. because yeah. that's something that isn't talked about it's in the claims book yeah. it's in the policy it's it gets no attention so and that will cost your policyholder money because all their skirting mm -hmm. all, anything they have under there their personal contents that are stored up underneath the house, they're covered. Their lawnmower, their, riding, their push mower that they shove up under the cover, it's yeah. covered yeah. under pop content. So that's a huge coverage issue. There's money right there for the policyholder and for the adjuster. There's your Harley you left in the corner that you didn't pay for. I mean, maybe not that. Yeah, there, not there's that. real money there. Yeah, not that. There, there's some money there. And some skirting is, is you know, fairly significant and doesn't get blown out all the time. Yeah. So. All right, anchoring requirements. If the manufactured home is in a special flood hazard area, it must be anchored the following manner at the time of loss. Over the top frame ties to the ground anchors in accordance with the manufacturer's specifications. These are or, any of yeah, the above. Yeah. Over the top, according to manufacturer or in compliance with the community. And if it doesn't meet any of these, then what? It's not a insurable building, is it? It's, it's not. It yeah. had, in a special flood hazard yeah. area, the anchor requirement is a policy qualifier, is, is a coverage yeah. qualifier. So if it's not anchored at all, or I'm not sure exactly how you would anchor it but not be in compliance. Mm -hmm. I, I know there's ways. Yeah. I, I can take you to com communities in South Louisiana. I'm sure I'll find ways that they've anchored they, them that they, don't fit yeah. one of these. Yeah. They may be suitable and they may be functional, but they don't meet one of these qualifiers. Mm -hmm. So you get three options. And it's got to meet one of those. And, that, and that's a big point I'd like to make out, to make point out is when adjusters go out and are looking at this, a lot of them just fail to document how it's anchored. Mm -hmm. And then, okay, if it's not anchored, well, what's the next step? According to the manufacturer, what's the next one? But if you don't have that, if you don't start with the top one, right. you don't photograph it and take pictures of the anchoring and put them in the file, You've started everybody a claim. out there. You started a claim that shouldn't have started. Exactly. Shouldn't have you spent one. a lot of time working with something that shouldn't start. But if you didn't take the pictures of those, we don't know if it's anchored or not. So we can't follow this. We can't say, okay, this is a covered building in this situation. Until this is done, you don't have a claim. We don't, there's nothing out there, right? Go to a coastal area and you find that all your frame ties are corroded and gone. Yeah. The anchors are there, pieces of the strapping are still in place, but it's not anchored. What does that mean? That. You don't have any three. You had intent, you had design, but nature removed the, the bindings which anchored it down. So it's no longer anchored and they're gone. So a question always comes up, manufactured home is in a special flood hazard area. What if it's not in a special flood hazard area? Does it still have to? Not according to the not according to, not according to the policy. So that, that, and that's another gray area. People go, oh no, it still has to be. But it's yeah. like, okay, but not according to the policy. It's not because it's not. That's in the a, way the policy reads. And, and, and there's, not and there's other exceptions too. Yeah. For instance, a travel trailer on wheels. Mm -hmm. Your first instinct, if you've been involved in the program, is that's not a covered building. Mm -hmm. But there's an exception. If the local community acknowledges it and accepts it into their floodplain as a building, which they have the right to do, then we can cover it mm -hmm. with the wheels on. Now, they can still hook it up and haul it out, which hopefully they will. 
which is a good thing. It's a good thing. But well, before the storm we, hits. Yeah, before the storm hits. But we would say no, you can't insure yeah. that. It's not secure. It's not anchored, and it's still got wheels on it. But there are some exceptions, and we we deal in a world of exceptions, don't we? So yes, we do. But I want you to remember that photo from the edition. Yeah. Because that's what this is where this comes into play. So if we have a mobile home, mm -hmm. a manufactured home in a special flood hazard that right. is not secured, okay. but has an addition that is secured, where where is our where's our gray where's our gray okay. area that we're gonna pass? So here's our three steps. Does it have over the top frame ties to the ground? Does it? It does not in this okay. situation. Have they anchored it to the ground based on the manufacturer specifications? Sounds like they haven't. Correct. And then finally, this is the good, here's, this is going to be the question: in compliance with the community's floodplain. That's a question that isn't necessarily an absolute yes or no. I would think no, but guess who has authority? The floodplain manager. So if you go to him and say, "Does this meet your qualifications for anchoring in your floodplain?" And he says yes, and I wanted it right. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> then you have the third. You don't. I don't believe you have one and two. No. But you might have third. But I wanted it right. Absolutely. And I would document with photos that the only thing holding that down is the addition by anchoring by piles by whatever method. I would, right. I would carefully. I would tell the story that it is tied down by only. And I've seen those. You know, nothing else is anchored except the addition and it's tied to the addition. So that would be where I would go. And let them give you a written response and then submit that claim and point to that letter and say, I spoke to Justin Trudeau and he's the, <laughs> he's the floodplain manager for Thibodeau County and he said it meets their regulations. Perfect. And then I'm gonna drive that claim all the way to the bank. <laughs> Pay that policy on <laughs> All right, special loss settlement. This is the one that we talked about, which is totally unique to manufactured homes. The manufactured home is totally destroyed or damaged to such an extent that in our judgment, it is not economically feasible to repair it to its pre-damaged condition. We will, at our discretion, pay the least of the following amounts. Replacement cost of the dwelling, RCV. 1.5 times actual cash value, calculation. The limit of liability on the deck page. However, to qualify for the special loss settlement, all of the following conditions must be met. It has to be a single family manufactured home. It has to be at least 16 feet wide, 600 square feet when fully assembled within the perimeter walls, it has to be principal residence. So some of that follows with single family, principal residence, falls in place with RCV coverage to begin with because RCV is part of what, one of the previous options but it's another qualifier for this. They don't want single wides. They don't want little bitty ones. Mm -hmm. We want a single family, want a principal residence, and we want, they've set a minimum size. So that's a unique settlement process that only applies to manufactured homes and no other type of building in our program. Common issues. This is a little bit of a rehash. Overvaluation, this can lead to overpayments to the policyholder. Undervaluation improperly limits the maximum settlement available to the policyholder. This is the one that we worry the most about because if we do a if we do a if we do a valuation which is not comprehensive that does not take into account all the things that are important, then we've taken their true limit of liability based on RCV and AC value. We've depressed them. And now if we have significant damage, we're going to bump into those thresholds and we have to stop paying. We can't pay past RCV and ACV yep. value yep. under any circumstance. So if you set them wrong, then you set a ceiling that we now, to get past it, we've got to go back and start over again. We've got to do another valuation and we've got to justify why the second one is right, not just bigger. Yeah. It's got to be, it's got to be accurate and, and, and you've got to be able to stand behind it and say, this one is right, that one is wrong, and here's why. And now we're going to pay them more money. And what I said early in the process, more money six months from now is not the same as the same amount of money in one month. You've, you've caused them harm because they've had to do things. 
Improper building components. Manufacturers homes have many unique components which are not typical of a traditional dwelling. They use wall panels that are different. They use all, all sorts of components. The doors, the, the, the doors with screens, perimeter doors, interior doors, lots of components in general, and it's not 100%, but in general, they're of lesser value um, because they're built to a lower standard in many cases. Now, yes, there are manufactured homes that are palatial and, and gorgeous and use high-end components, but those we don't have to worry so much about. It's the ones that are built to a modest standard that are economical, and those are the ones we have to make sure that our building component selections are proper so that we don't overpay. Last slide, modular homes. I put this on here because modular homes are sometimes confused with manufactured mm -hmm. homes. Absolutely. They are different. Two or more three-dimensional modules, factory built just like a manufactured home, delivered to the site just like a manufactured home. Perimeter walls are typically load bearing. They're not on a pier and, they're not on a purely pier and beam foundation. They may have a pier and beam down the center as additional support, but the perimeter walls are the are the load bearing members also, which is not like a manufactured home. Can be two or more stories tall. Regulations. IRC code, state regulated, federal government has no 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 dog in that hunt. They don't participate in this. Um, Modular homes are adjusted just like a traditional stick-built home. Um, they do have some unique practices in the assembly and the building of walls where they prefab walls with, with sprayed in insulation and they encapsulate and seal things up. That's for an adjuster to work through to figure out how best to resolve damages. But Modular homes, the short answer is they're not the same as manufactured. They're not adjusted the same. They're regulated differently. Their similarities are here, but they're a different animal. Don't confuse them. They have a different kind of ID plate, and that is not HUD. It'll be IRC. And um, we're seeing more and more of these, especially yep. on, on uh, on ICC claims where they've had a house destroyed, they'll put a foundation, drop a module on top of it, and some of those are very nice. They are, and, very and nice. they're yeah. well built. They're tight, um, and they. This is not new. This has been going on for about 25, 30 mm -hmm. years, but in certain markets, they, they're pretty prevalent. Mm -hmm. Florida's one. They're fairly prevalent down in the Florida market, and I'm sure in many other places around the country. But um, some of these things are really nice, and I like them. But. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because we see more and more these modular homes. Mm -hmm. And people go out and they immediately see a frame, they see something like, oh, this is a manufacturing, but I'm looking, I can't find any ID plate, I really can't find the information yep. I need, what I do, oh, I'm not going to write it, you know, it's just, but it's, no, it's not, you don't, you're not treating it as a manufactured home. This right. is, it's, this is a dwelling. Right? And sometimes the determination between manufactured and modular is, can be challenging mm -hmm. because they have similarities. Yep. And if you, if you go out and you see something and you immediately hang your hat on manufactured, it's hard to look away. Absolutely. You get hung up on it and the claim moves forward and somebody, hopefully, way up the line looks mm -hmm. at it and says, wait a minute, this is not a manufactured yeah. home. Yeah. I don't believe this is a manufactured home. Show me something that proves to me this is a manufactured home. Otherwise, we need to readjust this claim so we do it right. It's appreciable. It, it, it doesn't have all the things that we've just talked about so yeah. it's it's a good it's a good it's a good exercise and it, it's just like the modular homes there's some manufactured homes out there that you look at them and you go yeah there's no way this is a manufactured home no. it's just too nice and that's their whole point they're trying yeah. to do that uh, they, then, yeah they're trying to get away from the the standard yeah. what's you know just the t word aluminum shell and yeah. you're looking at that thing going okay you know they're going to move it out here in march go to the 67 yeah. regal yeah there's some extremely nice ones in there and that and i think that's important as well is because you go into some of these and you may see upgrades or you know you see a higher end cabinet in this yes. unit so not just a standard solid, solid service cabinet cost mobile there. home yeah. mobile home this mobile home that building components it's there's some really nice features in some of these. And those need to be accounted for in the adjusting process. Yeah. You, yeah. you have to consider what you're seeing because we offer what they have. Mm -hmm. And if they've got granite, then we offer granite. Yeah. If they've got true engineered or hardwood, 
we, we more often engineer, yeah. but there could be hardware yeah. upgrades, we but we go for it. Yeah. It's not just linoleum and vinyl. But that, and that's a good point you made. It's, you've got to you think manufactured home. Immediately you're thinking, I think some, some people think immediately lower quality, lower yeah. this, lower it's that. You've got to get that. Thing. Just take that out of your, your yeah. vocabulary, your mindset. This is a treat as a home, but we do have a serial number. We right. have information we have to gather. I mean, go out there as an adjuster. You're looking at that thing, and I think some of the top things that are often overlooked is, I shouldn't say overlooked, but the manufactured information, that information. Mm -hmm. If you're not gathering that, then, like point out, we don't have a claim yet. We don't have mm -hmm. anything we can gather. If you're not looking at the tie downs, mm -hmm. how it's anchored, you're, you don't have a claim you can write yet. Yeah. You're not looking at the upgrades and everything that will possibly go into evaluation. You, don't, you can't really write your claim. All this stuff, as we're going out there and we're looking at this, has to be gathered in the field. And sometimes this information is just is commonly overlooked. Yeah. It's not um, obvious. It doesn't, it doesn't jump out at yeah. you. It's not waving. Say, so yeah. here I am. You've got to go looking for it. And, it's the, and the thing is, you may have 25 claims, and one of these may be ma ma manufactured home. Well, the other 24, you, you've got the system. You're doing it over and over again. All of a sudden, you get to this one. You go, well, let me keep my system. Yeah. Oh, but I forgot this, 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 and this. And then it goes back, and somebody's looking at the file, and they're like, oh, we, we, we don't have all this information. Mm -hmm. Guess what you're doing? Going you're back. You're going back out. You're gathering the stuff. You're, you're going back to look at it again. And identifying the additions and the and, um, the shell itself and make sure it qualifies in regards. Because mm -hmm. is there ever a time where you could have – the manufactured home itself not qualify for RC, but the addition does? Is there ever, ever a situation like that? And is that a trick question? Should we ask? Should we ask? That's, I, I would have to spend a little time with that. When think you, about you think about it, you're like, okay, could, we, could this qualify over here and this not qualify because it doesn't meet the, let's just say it doesn't meet the 16 square feet. Or immediately. 16 foot wide, yeah. 600 square yeah. feet. Let's just say it doesn't need um, that. So then that wouldn't, but then do we have another situation where it would? And that's not a trick question for to ask you now, but we that would be that would be one you would have to work on. Yeah. Because you'd have to decide, number one, how is it how is it underwritten? Mm -hmm. You know, is it underwritten as a manufactured home or is it just underwritten as a dwelling and nobody identified it? Yeah. And now what do you actually have that you're working with? Can you split this thing and, and come up with a solution that applies coverage but doesn't Overpay the policyholder and doesn't yeah. violate any policy um, rules. Yeah. So I haven't worked one like that where we had that you specific know, it, situation. A situation where we, I've often seen them here when, when mobile homes come across the desk here is where you'll have 150,000 coverage. Uh -huh. Valuation gets run and it's 40. Yeah. And you're going, okay, we are way under, way over insured. Yeah. And, and, and that's not uncommon. Yeah, I mean, it really is not because when they bought the insurance, it was based on the lien, which took the mm -hmm. value of the manufactured home and may even in, have included some land value. Yeah. Um, and as long as that loan is in place, the lien holder's not going to be real excited about you reducing coverage every year. They want their yeah. equity protected. Yeah. So if you say, you know, I'm going to reduce my coverage 15% uh, a year over the next 20 years, they're probably going to push back on that. So that's a catch-22. Policyholder yeah, can't reduce coverage, but yet yeah. they can't. They're, they're, they don't have value in the property that matches the coverage that they purchased. So And and then when they have a loss, it's a shock. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What happened? And the adjuster is the coverage. one yeah. who has to say, yeah. Ms. Jones, we have 150000 in coverage, but yeah. we only have 50000 in value. And that's a hard conversation yes, to have. Yes, and it, it needs is. to be had early. Yes, yeah. Very good point. Very early because, yeah, yeah. it's and it's something that uh, something that has to be brought up. Yeah, you it can't has to be brought up early in the process. Can't ignore no it. No people because it is. You're right. It's a very hard conversation to have. And I'm immediately telling you, you're not getting a hundred thousand dollars. You're immediately going to get defensive and upset about this whole process. What's going on? So you have to communicate that when you identify it from the beginning. You know, you may even want to bring the agent in, have the agent involved in this conversation. To make sure everybody's clear on what took place and why it's where it is, right. so there is no issue. You don't want to wait till the settlement. And I've mm -hmm. seen some situations where it's all of a sudden, okay, here's what I'm, here's what you're getting. Wait a minute, where's the rest of it? Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay, yeah. It's just it's a process. You have to communicate. Just like we're talking about, there's there's things that you're doing with the manufactured home 
that if you overlook those steps, it can lead to a unsatisfied customer, it can lead to uh, dissatisfaction the whole process, and they're gonna look, start looking elsewhere and figure out what's going on with this whole yeah. process, why is it flawed, but we know what we need to be doing as adjusters to get this information out there to report it early and often and gather all the information we need to make sure this is a successful claim. The more transparent you are early, the better off. You know, you may not be able to avoid that claim going into the appeals process or even into litigation. You may not be able yeah. to, but it's your job to do everything but that you can exactly. to honestly inform the policyholder what parameters are gonna have a, an impact on their settlement and why. And if you do that and it still runs the gamut all the way through the litigation, then you've done your job. But if you do your job well, you're going to um, you're going to find that that's not going to be the norm. That's going to be the exception. And and the policyholder, you know, bad news is better. You know, sooner the better. Um, there's no better time to have it. There's no good time to have it. But there, yeah, there's exactly. always a bad time. Exactly. And it's way down the road. Exactly. Yeah. So. Not six months later. No. Because then and there, right then and there. Yeah. When you know it, just. Communicate. Yeah. Dan, you have any questions? I don't have any questions Nothing. at all. Nothing now. No questions? Just you had all these questions and about you know what it was, was good? You covered some of the questions we had, some of the things Absolutely. we wanted to address. You covered them all. That's what I hope. You covered them all. Man, like we talked about when you came on, we appreciate you coming on because you are the subject matter in this. I mean, you know the information, you deal with it, you give us that different perspective from the NFIP side, from what you you all see out there in the field and what how to make the field adjuster's job easier, what the field adjuster should be doing, and the little, the little areas, if we overlook it, how it can cause issues. Yeah. And so by giving us all this information helps us and everybody out there do their job better for the customer, because that's ultimately what we're doing. We're out there to make sure we're taking care of each and every customer out there. Yeah. The consequences of some of these little things aren't obvious until you work toward the end of the claim, and then you figure out your hamstrung because hmm? You overlook something yeah. that didn't seem all that important in the beginning, but it, the the whole process fits. Yeah. And everything is part of the it's, it's all part of the package. And we, well, we really again we appreciate you coming out. We appreciate you taking your time out here. I appreciate um, you having. Thanks, thanks for having us out here. And with that, we're going to open it up to any questions from the um, audience. If anybody has any questions out there you want to ask, um, just drop them to Julie, and she will be able to. Uh, address them, we'll, we'll, we'll get them answered. So, Certainly. Um, thank you, I appreciate everybody's time. And I, I appreciate everybody taking the time to, to, to listen and, and hopefully there was some value in what we presented. Um, it, it, it's an important issue um, because it affects a policyholder and that's the real thing. Yep. If, it's, if, it's, if it's done improperly, we can do harm and we don't want to do that. No. And, and the, one thing, I'll, I'll, besides helping the policy, it also helps the adjuster. When you know what you're doing and you're able to apply it into your daily routine, every, every you you lose that those issues, you get rid of those. You lose the stress. You lose the things that will cause problems later on that you want to resolve now. And it's you know it's we're out there to to run a claim as, as quickly and accurately as possible. But missing out on little things like this cause a lot of stress and cause a lot of people just to to. I want to say melt down, but kind of melt down and not flow through the process like they should. So understanding all these little steps and understand, and if you ever get out there and you were given a manufactured home before and you don't have the authorization to do it, reach out, find out why you've given this claim and what you need to do in order, what you need to do to give it back. Because really shouldn't have, you don't have the authorization to do that. No. And the reason you don't is because we haven't given that experience, that opportunity to learn that and, and go out with somebody and experience that because the we want to make sure everybody has their authorization for these things so that you're able to give those opportunities to go out there and take a look at these properties and do that kind of stuff. Because if you're not, you don't know the steps that you need to do in order to make that claim successful. And we want to make sure every single solitary claim is successful, not only for the policyholder, but for the adjusters as well. So, and the examiners too. The examiners are very important too. I think it kind of goes both ways, whether you have the authorization or not. As an adjuster, ask the question. Don't be afraid to ask questions. No. If you don't know what you're doing, it's okay to call someone in management and say, hey, you know, how do I get through this, this portion of it? I don't exactly know what I'm looking at. That will cure 99% of the issues we have with these files moving forward. So don't be afraid to talk. 
uh, ego gets the best of us every time. Yeah. And uh, to, if you get rid of that portion, then everything goes great. I mean, yeah. it, it's the event will dictate in every situation whether there's going to be an opportunity to get somebody to come help you, or if you just need to let it go and, and get one at a later time. The, the, the event's going to dictate that. Absolutely. And it's not going to be a, it's not going to be a gray area. They're either going to say, hey, I've got somebody that can help you, or give it back. We'll give you something else. And it's probably going to be a real quick answer. So, <laughs> Again, Terry, thank you. Thanks for your time again. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. it. I enjoyed it. Really appreciate it. And anybody, again, uh, if you have any questions, Julie, are there any questions for, from the audience? Let me see here. The first one, I believe you answered. Can you hear me, Terry? Yes, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, the first one, I believe you answered, but in case someone missed it, if a mobile home is added to a slab on grade, does the mobile home guidance supersede or at what percentage does one dwelling or mobile home guidance supersede the other? So that process would begin with the deck page. What was insured? Was it a dwelling or was it a manufactured home? If it's a manufactured home, then the additions become part of the additions and options. And your adjustment starts with a manufactured home and those parameters have to follow suit. However, if it starts as a dwelling and they added a manufactured home to it, that flips it. You have a dwelling which could qualify for replacement cost under other circumstances. And then you're gonna to have to treat the manufactured home as an addition if it is properly attached by one of the acceptable means to um, an insurance addition to the home. It could also have a separate policy attached, just like you have uh, two buildings side by side and they're attached by an elevated walkway. You can have one policy for both or you can have a policy for each. So in this situation, you could have a policy for each or a single policy with something which is added on. And, the, and it, you start with how it's rated. What's it rated as? Which item was insured? And then you whatever they added to it. But we, if it's properly attached, then we owe for damages to all of it. Okay. All right. The next question was, are corporation docs needed uh, for established manufactured parks to determine pre post firm status? That would be one method of doing it. Um, you could speak to the tax assessor's office to find out, you know, when they establish certain areas. But yeah, that's going to be that's going to be one of several possibilities to determine when the park or the phase of the park or the entire park was established to service those mobile home sites. Okay. Um, the other question is: uh, It says mobile home doesn't meet requirements for a fixed but addition constructed on a foundation. Isn't the addition available for coverage? Okay, the, the manufactured home does not meet the requirements to be insured. Repeat that. One it says time. mobile home doesn't meet requirements for a fixed, but addition constructed on a foundation isn't the addition available for coverage. I would approach that the same way the one that Daniel was talking about. Uh, and see whether the manufactured, I'm sorry, see whether the community accepts the attachment as the form of anchoring. And if they do, then you can proceed with the full adjustment of the property. Um, if they don't, if we've insured a, a manufactured home and it's not anchored and the community doesn't consider the addition an acceptable anchoring, whether any insurance to the addition. Um, there's a lot of particulars that we would have to investigate to give a straight answer on that. It's kind of a, but that's going to be one that's going to have to be looked at carefully, discussed, and your in your WIO is going to be one who will ultimately um, give you an answer on that. But that's not going to be an easy one. Little what if? Right. Yeah, I think I think that comes straight back to the 
to the floodplain manager as well. I think a, a yes. lot of that answer comes directly back to them. Uh, because, uh, as we spoke about in um, in the presentation, uh, we had that situation where we have the the mobile home that is not a fixed, and then we have the addition. And our the floodplain manager for this region said, "No, we're we we're, we're not going to um, we're not going to accept any of that." So, so that's the one that you and I spoke of. Correct. Morning, and they said, "No, sir." Correct. Well, there's your answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Then there was the one in the Q and A box. It says, uh, "Garden sheds made into a home, tiny home. How would that work with FEMA flood?" Not going to be a short answer, but I, I can certainly delve into it. Uh, first off, manufactured home adjustment practices do not apply because it's not a manufactured home. It is a factory built home in most cases. It's transported to the site. You can also have stick built, but for the, the vast majority of them, they're factory built and they travel on a truck. The guy comes out with a little mule type device and they set it in place. So once you get it in place, um, they typically are renovated or modernized to build a small tiny home. And this is a fairly, common practice. It's becoming more and more prevalent and tiny home uh, connoisseurs around the country. It can be insured as a dwelling, but it's going to be accepted. If it's in a special flood hazard zone, it's going to have to be accepted by the community in that location. Um, you can't just drop one in a floodplain without anchoring it and without getting a permit. You've got a problem there. You have a community's regulations. Um, you've kind of done something without their knowledge and then along comes a policy and you have to deal with what's left, you know, what happens? Did this thing float away? Was it completely destroyed? But the short tiny home is insurable as a dwelling as long as it's properly installed based on local floodplain requirements and manufactured home practices do not apply to it. Okay. Well, that looks like that's it on the questions. Did either of you have anything else you wanna add? Um, just, I, I want to thank everyone for their time. We had a lot of people show up for the presentation. I hope it gave value to at least most of you. And if follow-up questions show up at your desk, Julie, at a later time, you should forward them to me and I'll be happy to, to, uh, give an appropriate response and you can send it back down the channel. I will do that. Dan. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for everybody for attending. Uh, first and foremost, you're the reason that we put all of these on. I get this information out to you guys uh, is in the best format possible. Um, it takes people uh, with experience like Terry um, come out and, and give this and and give you guys exactly what you need to uh, make the correct decisions in the field or get the correct documentation that we need to make the proper decision uh, up the ladder. So um, I appreciate everybody's time. It's a lot of information to take on, uh, but I think Terry did the uh, the stellar job getting that across to everybody. So. Yes, thank you very much, Terry. We appreciate it so much. All right, guys, we will see you in two weeks for the next Claims Corner. And um, have a good weekend. Thank you, y'all. Take care. Bye now. Bye.